Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Scott Cook, uh, thank you for your contribution to this Longmont Voices and in, in Vision project. Uh, each of these interviews have started by learning a little bit about who we're interviewing. And you play a critical role in this community. It, it's important for people to know who you are and what you do. So take it away. Sure. Well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this project. And uh, I think it's a really neat thing. And I'm looking forward to looking viewing all these later on in the future yeah. when I'm looking back at this time. But uh, my name is Scott Cook. I'm the CEO for the Longmont Chamber of Commerce. I've actually been at the chamber for uh, over 13 years, uh, not the entire time as a CEO, but uh, held various different roles at the chamber. And I did grow up here in Longmont, so not quite a native, um, but I did grow up here. And I'm, I feel very fortunate to be able to uh, work in my own community, help my own uh, hometown uh, prosper. Uh, you, we've probably already t spoke about in previous interviews how we were America's number one boomtown last year. It's just great to be a part of all of that. I'm very proud of this community. And um, even in, during this time, I'm very proud of our community. I think in some ways, uh, we're, we'll get into that, but it's going to be exciting how we, what we learn from this crisis and how we grow together uh, as a community, how we grow together as Longmont. Uh, well, that's a great introduction, and and we're going to segue from that right into the first of my three questions you know I'm going to ask, and that is, in this time of so many unknowns and all the anxiety that goes along with the unknowns and, and the, the conditions with which we're living now in this pandemic, how are you getting yourself through this period of time? Yeah, and I'm sure you've heard this from other people too, but you know, you take each day at a time, and each day I wake up and I tell myself, this is, this is how I prep myself. I tell myself, today is going to be a new adventure. It's not going to be like yesterday's adventures. It's not going to be like tomorrow's adventures. Today is going to be all its own. Yeah. Um, and that is the reality that we have right now because there, there will be new news that comes out today that adjusts that reality. And then you've got to go back and, and work with your staff and the rest of your community partners and, on that, on that new reality. Um, and so I think just waking up with an idea of let's be flexible today let's see what happens and then we're going to roll with it um in one sense we don't have a choice um but in another <laughs> sense we can be out in front of it you know and see what what we can do so there is i will and i don't want to make light of it but there is a certain excitement uh with that um because there's so much that we can do um and there's so much that we can accomplish um at the chamber you know we initially uh shut down all of our events and, and programs and committee meetings and things like that. Um, at its core, the Chamber of Commerce or any Chamber of Commerce is a social organization. We, we bring people together, that's what we do, you know? Um, and so that was hard for us to do that, but slowly now we've been actually opening many of those back up, not our networking events, of course, um, but over Zoom, over this technology, we're opening up all our committee meetings and things like that. So. 
um, that's been really good to see. And I, I mean, I love seeing all the different members and I think they're enjoying seeing each other as well and connecting over that. So that's one thing that we're doing uh, to get through. The Chamber's also um, has built a number of different um, partnerships over the past few years. And uh, I was commenting to one of them the other day that, you know, I think partnerships were a good thing for us in the past and they were certainly helpful, helpful for us. Now they're essential for us. I mean, we really are relying on all the different partners. That includes the city, our advanced uh, Longmont partners, our chambers around our region, Broomfield and Boulder counties, and then the state and even the country. And uh, so we're constantly using those partnerships, constantly mining ideas from all of those different organizations to see what we can bring back to Longmont and, and what we can do to build our business community back here. Well, really, really pretty task and, and uh, mission focused during this time for you. Um, in, in this time of physical separation and social distancing, when we can't actually be together physically, how are you staying connected to family and friends? Yeah, it, that, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I feel in some ways that we're hyper-connected over technology like yeah. this over Zoom. And then on the other hand, we're not. And we're, we're hearing a lot about loneliness and people feeling uh, alone right now. You know, at work, um, we used to, at the chamber, we used to have weekly staff meetings. We now do those twice a week. Um, and like I said, we're bringing back our committees and things like that over, over Zoom. I think one of the things that I've tried to do is be diligent or purposeful about connecting. It's one thing to connect over this technology and, and do the work that you were supposed to do. But what happens in the office, uh, as we all know, is that you get to know people, you get to know their emotions, if they're having a good day or a bad day, you know, or when to go in their office or when not to, you know, those kind of things. And um, you also learn about people, you, you learn about your staff and what motivates them, their personal lives and things like that. So not every staff meeting, but um, on some of them, you know, we'll just spend a little bit of time checking in with each other personally and seeing how everybody's doing. And I find that interesting now because we're having to be, again, purposeful about it. It doesn't just kind of happen naturally as the day goes through, as you get to, if you work with someone, but now you actually have to be very purposeful about asking them, how are you? you no, know, really, how are you doing right now? You know, or what can I help you with? And, and, and that kind of thing. So that's something that I've tried to be cognizant of and, and do. Um, on a more personal note, um, each day I just make a list of one to three people, doesn't have to be long, sometimes it is only one person, um, that I'm gonna call or email that day and just say, hey, how are you? Nothing long or anything like that, but I just want to check in on you and see how you're doing. I think people like that. Um, I've been on the receiving end of uh, messages like that. I know I certainly appreciate it. Um, it goes a long way and it's also very motivating as well. Um, so I'm enjoying receiving that, I hope other people uh, enjoy getting a quick Facebook message from me or text or something like that too. So, I'm guessing they do. Uh, if, if you enjoy it, I, I'm guessing others are going to enjoy it as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> my third question is uh, more less about right now and more about um, you know what's coming. Uh, the, the presumption that underlies this third question is that whatever was normal before the pandemic, uh, life is going to be different when we are on the other side of this pandemic. So whatever was normal then, not likely gonna be the new normal. Now, there's a lot of unknowns. We don't know what the new normal is gonna be and what we're gonna settle back into. But I, I would like to know, what would you like to see? What's your preferred future? What would you like to see in the new normal and help to create in the new normal? Yeah, and again, I love this question, Tim, and I thought about this for quite a while. Um, and it's a hard question to, to answer in some ways, and maybe maybe other ways it's it's easier. I think what we've all heard or probably experienced is that it feels, at least for me, it feels like time has sped up quite dramatically, but then also it feels like time has really slowed down. And if I've heard it from one person, I've heard it from many, that nobody knows what day it is anymore, or you know which meeting they're supposed to be in, and, and that kind of thing. So there is, there's a different outlook on time. Um, but when time slows down, you know, what do we do with that? 
Well, we, we relax more. We, we spend time with family. We spend time getting to know our neighbor better or having a, just a friendly chat or we take up a new hobby or we, we do something. And I think in our very fast paced, very connected world of before, um, we, we didn't always have that luxury. We didn't have the luxury of, of time. Um, and I think we got a little bit of that back in this, this moment. I think one of the um, victims of, of that, of not having enough time, I was reading an article the other day where the author um, was lamenting the fact that we, we have very little long form uh, TV journalism anymore. We have sound bites of little bits of information, um, but we don't really have any time. This still exists some in printed media, um, but we don't really have time for a long interview to really get to, to know a political candidate or um, a thought leader in, in, in the country or in the world. And that's not just the media's fault. It's, it's, it's the consumer's fault as well. We don't have the time. We don't have the interest or haven't had the interest. Maybe we haven't been willing to pay for it. Um, and so I think that's a victim of this, that fast paced society. And so what, what that has led to in part is that we have you know, these different sides and never the two sides should meet or talk and, and share ideas. But I think what, what, what we're hearing in this time, and, and I love hearing it, it's very motivating and there's a comfort to it. We're all in this together. But as we hopefully can start to come out of this time, we're all gonna need to be working together as well. And what is that going to take? That's going to take understanding where different people are coming from, their fears, their needs, and pulling that all together. If we're gonna build the community back, if we're gonna build the country back, even the world, it's gonna take putting all those different ideas together. I think we're seeing that even now with the whole conversation, should we open up the economy right now or should we stay at home still? Um, and, I, and I look at that, I'm like, okay, we still haven't quite learned to you know, there are some significant health concerns that we need to consider. And there are some significant economic concerns that we need to consider. <laughs> um, and if we're going to build this back, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna work together for a future, we are gonna have to work together. And we're not gonna do that by just disagreement. We're gonna have to figure out, okay, we're gonna have to, comp one side's gonna have to compromise a little bit, and this side's gonna have to compromise a little bit to put something together. Um, so I hope, I hope that we are able to do more of that, that we have actually will take the time to, to listen to each other. I think, I don't know if this is so much a preferred future, um, but I think one of the interesting things that will come out of this is there's been very few times, and I don't know if there's ever been a time quite like this, where the entire world has experienced something together. Yeah. Um, we're sharing an experience with every single person on the planet right now, which is very interesting. I mean, that's the world that we live in. Um, yes, but it, that's just a very interesting thing that we're that's happening to all of us as humans at once. Um, so I think there'll be kind of a hyper global as a global thought. And then at the same time, there is a real local thought, like we really need to support our neighbors and our local businesses and our entrepreneurs and things like that. So I think that's gonna be interesting how those two interplay with each other. And I would say that my preferred, preferred future with that is that I do hope that we um, recognize what it takes to open a business, that we recognize um, what it takes for an entrepreneur. They take significant risks. If we're gonna build ourselves out of this, if we're gonna get our economy back on track, and if we're gonna create prosperity for all, it's gonna be because some people took risks and some people built something that created something so we could offer more jobs and that sort of thing. So I hope that there's an understanding and a knowledge of um, what it takes to build a business, that we have some admiration for an entrepreneur, for the risk taker, the person that's willing to go out there and say, hey, I'm just gonna do it. You know, that's, that's the American spirit that's part of the American dream. I hope that we can still keep that uh, spirit alive and even have it even be bigger than before. I mean, that, that would be 
that would definitely be a preferred future of mine. Scott Cook, if there was ever a time in the world uh, where th there should be an appetite and an enthusiasm uh, to support the very people who are going to help build ourselves into whatever our future is, it's now. Right. So thanks for being part of it. Thanks for your leadership in the community. Thanks again for your willingness to contribute to this project. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourself and your family. All right, thank you, Tim. Chris McGilvery, thank you for your contributions to this Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Uh, as you know, we have started each of these interviews by learning a little bit about the interviewee. So tell us about you, who you are, and what you do in the community. Sure, well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Waters, Councilman Waters, for uh, really stepping up to the plate with this assignment. And uh, this is a really important and uh, special project that you're undertaking. So um, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, so who is Chris I, I McGill? I'm just a bit player in this, Chris. But <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the acknowledgement. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, so who is Chris McGillray? So I'm, uh, first of all, I'm a husband um, uh, to Stephanie, my wife. We have been married. It's gonna be our 15th uh, anniversary this July. I'm a father to two children in the St. Brain Valley School District. I have a 10 year old daughter and a six year old son. Uh, they go to Flagstaff Academy. I'm a business owner. I own Longmont Liquors on the corner of Second and Main. Uh, Steph and I, we started that business in 2012. I am a passionate educator. I teach full time at Front Range Community College. I, I've taught uh, at that institution for five years and I am a community leader. So I am currently the chair of the Longmont Area uh, Chamber of Commerce. I've been on the board of directors for uh, five years. I'm on the downtown development board of directors. I'm the vice chair of that organization. I'm on the Tinker Mill Makerspace board of directors. Um, I serve in a variety of capacities uh, at the college. And so, I'm on the advisory board for business accounting uh, at the Boulder County campus. And I am an advisor to the Chamber Student Network, which is something I'm really proud of. It's a uh, student run Chamber of Commerce locally. It's actually the first in the nation that's 100% organized and structured by students. And so previous to my time as a business owner, I spent 12 years in corporate retail I worked at Target for 12 years, serving in a variety of different capacities. I was um, a general manager of a super Target in Salt Lake City, and I was a field merchandiser and really learned how to manage a business. And then in 2012, I, um, I learned quickly how to own one, two totally different competencies. <laughs> and so um, that's a little bit about me. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate. Um, I'm passionate for Longmont. I fell in love with this community, and it certainly wasn't the our master plan. That's not the reason why I fell in love with our community or um, our city code. All this is important, um, but it's the people. It's the people of this community. Um, Steph and I have received so much support over the last eight years, and it's. I look for every opportunity I can to give back and. Uh, to serve. And when I serve, it's not donating inventory for my business. It's not monetary. Uh, it's time. And I really look for opportunities to, to give time and serve others. And um, Longmont, look, we're, we're a community that's built on hard workers, honest, resilient, um, innovation, entrepreneurial, and I'm, I'm very proud to be a member of this community, Tim. Well, in terms of uh, donation of time, what you're doing with this interview is part of that. Uh, and, and this may be, these 15 minutes may be the only spare time you have given all the other things you're doing. So, uh, Chris, I do appreciate it. And, Absolutely. And, um, and the three, you know the three questions I'm going to ask. And the first one is this. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment in history that none of, no one on the planet's ever lived through what we're going through right now. Uh, there are times in history where it might have been something like this, but nobody alive has experienced this before. So mm -hmm. with all the unknowns, um, the uncertainties, and the fears that go along with that, how are you getting yourself through this period of time? 
that's a great question. I, um, I'm staying busy. I've always been very busy, but it starts in my home. Um, Steph and I really working together and supporting each other. Um, I've always been a pretty decent person when it comes to multitasking, but um, through this crisis, I've really um, had to strengthen my ability to multitask. Our, our children are being homeschooled, so I'm, I'm supporting Steph. She taught second grade for 12 years, and so she that's her thing, but I'm making sure that I'm supporting her through that process. And during the semesters, Pam, my uh, staff runs our business while I'm teaching. And so because Steph's being home right now, um, homeschooling, I've been working the business, working her shifts, and really um, uh, spending a, a bit more time in the business. Uh, also during this transition is uh, all the classes uh, at college have been converted to online. And I'm also the online lead uh, at our college. And so I'm trying to help all, all of our instructors who have never taught online and who had no intentions of teaching online or um, being introduced to remote learning pedagogies. And I'm really trying to mentor and coach them through this transition um, to ensure a great student experience to that. And so it's it's about multitasking. It's about balancing. Uh, I've, I've found that the days are going very fast. The weeks are flying by, but it's been a long month. Yeah. if that makes sense. I mean, looking back at the month and um, I'm looking for opportunities, Tim, to, um, for micro opportunities to, to be a good citizen, be a good person, provide value, help people. Um, I've never been in the delivery business, um, but I, I'm helping to encourage people to stay home and I'm personally de delivering to, to folks, especially the vulnerable during this time. And, um, I'm doing grocery shopping for my mom and friends and family that are um, that are seniors and trying to encourage them to stay at home. So the, the micro examples, and I'm, I'm noticing a lot of that. If you look around, we're just, there's a ton of empathy being demonstrated. There's a ton of just helping each other, really taking care of our neighbors. And it's been really inspiring. I've picked up the phone more in the last month than I have in the last five years. I've I talk to my mom daily, so I've been calling a lot of friends and family and reaching out to them and just staying connected, reaching out to the business community, asking them how I can support them and just listening to them. And, um, and so uh, lim I'm not a TV watcher, so I'm really trying to limit um, the TV watching, although Steph and I are getting into a couple of shows. Um, Homeland, that's our favorite show right now. We love that show. Um, I'm really into reading too and just staying busy, um, self-help and different things around education, around pedagogy, stuff like that. Um, those are things that I, and the kids, they're always wanting to play Legos and I'm um, trying to remain firmly planted in the present so that I can appreciate the moment um, and do the best that I can every day. All right, well, um, every day, we are finding ourselves <clears throat> physically separated. Obviously, your kids are with you and your wife, but physically separated from other family members and friends and socially isolated from colleagues in, in ways that we also haven't experienced in the past. And you, right. you've begun to answer a little bit of this question, I think, already, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And that is, how are you staying connected to family and friends? Well, social media, I, I think, you know, with Facebook and Instagram and uh, Zoom meetings, uh, for example, Steph and I look forward to Easter every year. We, you know, we, we go to mass and then we go to Steph's family for a great dinner. And obviously the context has changed dramatically. So that experience is different, right? So we're using technology. There's a lot of WebExes. There's a ton of Zoom meetings. I mean, so Easter uh, dinner, we, we had our entire family in Zoom meetings. And I, there's, you know, one of the positives is we have the technology to help us stay connected. And I've been um, leveraging that. And we've seen family members that, and spoken to family members that we hadn't um, for years during this um, time. So, um, you know, phone calls mean a lot too. And um, so it's just reframing how you're connecting with people, just with what you and I are doing right now. Um, I feel connected in this conversation. So it's a different, Healing, it's a different experience, but it's really important. 
uh, you know, I've shared with you that I, I've tried to minimize my comments during these interviews, but I will say this. Uh, I have, for, for people who use their phones for everything but phone calls, I've heard a lot of people using their phones for actually making phone calls in the last yeah. week. So. Well, absolutely. You know, the yeah. average person spends three or four hours a day on social media. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The phone, the, using the phone for phone calls was had become kind of obsolete <laughs> in, in, in some exactly. circles. But in the last month, we've re reinvigorated actually calling. Right. So my third question, uh, which you know that's it, coming, is uh, based on the presumption that whatever was normal for us before the pandemic, uh, life's going to be different on the other side of the pandemic. And we're not certain how, right? Uh, but I think it's reasonable to assume that there will be a new normal. We just don't know what it is. So my question for you is what would you like to see as the new normal and help create as the new normal? Yeah, things are going to be different, as you just mentioned. And so as we progress forward as a community, we we have to understand that this is not a this is not a sprint to the finish line. This is a marathon in how we progress forward. Um, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of um, energy. Um, and more than anything, it's going to take a ton of patience to um, emerge from this pandemic better. And I believe uh, we will. I'm very confident that we will as a community. I think it's important to not lose focus of our past successes that we've that have shaped us and positioned us extremely well as we progress forward. We have a strong city. We have strong leadership. Uh, we have strong community leadership, and we've experienced strong collaboration not just through this crisis, but through a lot of disasters. Uh, you know, the 100-year flood the focus on South Maine, we've accomplished some very special things um, throughout, um, throughout recent years. And so we, we can't forget about these accomplishments. Um, and so I think how we've responded to this crisis, Tim, uh, is just a great example of that. You know, the Advanced Longmont Partners, which consists of the city of Longmont, uh, the council, the LDDA, the Economic Development Partnership, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the SBDC, they've stepped up huge. Um, and so all these entities, all these organizations coming together to collaborate, meeting daily to respond and to, uh, in a relevant manner to our current needs as a community. And it's been um, very ins inspirational um, to see that. So just a solid example of resiliency, um, empathy, the care for each other. And so I think it's important to remember it wasn't long ago that we were recognized nationally as the number one boom town in America, right? There's a lot of measurements that went into that. GDP growth, job creation, unemployment, which we were hovering around two and a half percent, strong commerce, entrepreneurship, housing growth. So we are Longmont. And I don't think, even though the context has changed in a significant way, the people and the vision haven't. And so we have to remember that. We have the foundation, we've demonstrated it, and we will demonstrate it in the future. And so uh, through strong leadership, through strong, clear clarity around our vision and our objectives, um, at Advanced Longmont, the five-year strategy, and then we just worked through the Advanced Longmont 2.0 strategy as we progress forward. So you have all these different community organizations working together. We have a similar vision as we progress forward. And so when I look at the future of Longmont, I, I kind of put them into three different pillars. The first being our economy. We have to have a thriving economy and we will. The second is our education system. We have to thrive and invest in our education. which We've done a lot of great things and we will continue to do that. And the third pillar is, uh, I refer to this as sustainable, sustainability, right? So I wanted to share briefly about each of those three, uh, starting with a thriving economy that's equitable for, for all. So it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter who we know, what bank that we work with, what committee we may serve on, if we, what news channel we watch, if it's CNN, if it's Fox News, hell, if it's Disney Channel, it doesn't matter. We're equitable for all. 
And that's the type of economy that we have had and we will continue to have as we progress forward. And there's this sense of belonging. I belong in Longmont, right? Tim Waters belongs in Longmont. So there's that feeling of belongingness that um, we can achieve the life that we desire through living, working, playing, and learning in this community moving forward. And healthy businesses are a big part of that. And healthy businesses provide opportunities for growth for our community. Just think about all the revenue that flows in through a small, let's just use my business, for example. And I'm probably the smallest wine shop in the state of Colorado, right? They're sitting on the corner of 2nd and Main. But think about it over the last eight years, Tim, where all the revenue that I've produced through sales tax that gets reinvested into our, um, you know, our community. There's the, the taxes through income tax. There's the access tax. There's the payroll tax. There's the property tax. And all that gets reinvested to provide the things that we, we need to and that our community members expect. And so, plus, uh, there's jobs, right, that I've provided. So, um, and that's actually one of the things I'm most proud of is when I could build a business to the point where I could actually hire my first employee. Tim, that was by far one of the greatest feelings of my entire life is, you know, having that opportunity to help somebody else and employ somebody else. And with that comes great responsibility and, um, and great pride. And so, having a thriving economy is extremely critical. And um, the other is we need to have an education and we already have that's, that's placed our number one priority in developing a thriving community by preparing people to be productive in a global ecosystem, right? We live in a world where things are changing so damn fast, but we have to prepare our students to be productive in the workforce. Um, the focus that we've placed recently around early childhood development, I've been extremely impressed with, and the emphasis on, uh, that's great progress, and that's a good sign of what's, what's in our future as it relates to our focus on education. We, we can never start too early in educating our, um, our future, so that's, that's great. You know, continuing to emphasize preparing our students for the successful pathway that they decide. And what I've, my experience in education finds that most of us have three pathways, student pathways, and it's either the pathway to, I wanna develop a skill set to be productive. And whether it's in manufacturing, which by the way, the average salary in Longmont is 68,000 if you want in manufacturing. So it's, that's one pathway that's, that's really important to our economy. Uh, the other pathway is the transfer. You have students that uh, through the district, through the St. Brain School District, will go to Front Range Community College and then transfer to CU or CSU or Metro. And something I'm really proud of is over the last couple of years, we've built a solid transfer success rate and uh, coming out of our program at the college. And, and so let's continue to emphasize that. And then the third pathway, is a pathway that doesn't get a lot of a ton of attention, but it has as of recent over the last year, year or two, and that's students that have an intention to build something and start a business of their own. And we've done a lot of great things over the last couple of years to build strong community partnerships with the Economic Development Partnership, Innovate Campus, Tinker Mill, and all these organizations. E for All is another one where students could go in and and really have the support to build something of their own, launch that and sustain that long-term. And so um, I envision that we're gonna continue to get recognized on a national level around the quality of education that we um, offer our students. Uh, some of the, the trends that are gonna influence this that we need to pay attention to, there's gonna be increasingly um, more emphasis on actual learning versus actual teaching. You know, and that's something that I'm constantly challenging myself on is, am I teaching, are the students learning the things that they need to learn coming out of our program to be productive, to achieve their goals? And through active learning, through community-based learning, um, there's going to be strong conversation around asynchronous or synchronous learning. And um, so, so that there's that trend in, in education and the relevance of education. There's going to be less emphasis on actual content and more emphasis on context 
meaning you and I can Google any question into our phone and we get instant information. So data is not going to be a problem. There's information out there and we need to ensure that we're teaching and educating folks to use thinking critically skills to analyze the data in this device and make wise decisions. So it's going to be more, more emphasis around giving students an opportunity to learn through application versus just learning something to pass a test. So there's going to be huge increases in concurrent enrollment and online learning and um, really identifying a student's purpose and why and trying to help them achieve um, their goals. So education is critical and we need to continue to um, put the resources into education. And like I said, there's, we, we're doing a lot of great things. We can't lose sight of that. Um, the St. Brain School District, their leadership um, through um, the Innovation Center and through connecting students through commerce and through industry through the Chamber Student Network and building those strong community partnerships with IBM and industry. Those are some great examples of what we've what we we've done, what we're going to continue to do. And the same thing through Front Range Community College. They're the Center for Integrated Manufacturing. That's like our hidden gem, right? So we're teaching students about robotics and automation and manufacturing and all those career paths that um, are high earnings coming out of the program. And so there's going to be what I envision around our education is increasing the focus on trade schools too. I mean, HVAC, plumbing, waste management, being electrician, all these paths are paths to build a great life for yourself and your family. I mean, the average income of a trash woman or a trash man in Boulder County is over a hundred thousand dollars a year and not a lot of us recognize that there's a lot of great career opportunities um, in in um, trade and so that's education right it's something that I'm really really passionate about it's something obviously you spending your entire career in education can relate to and the third pillar that I want to highlight is the focus on sustainability and sustainable growth, um, economic, environmental, and um, social. And it's about meeting the short-term needs of, of the present, okay, without compromising meeting the needs of the, what's in our future. And I've learned this in business where I need to generate enough revenue to pay my utility bill to meet my payroll in the now. So there's those immediate needs that I need to meet and I try to educate my students and help them understand that the number one thing in business is not profitability. It's not, it's about sustainability, right? What can you do to build a solid structure and a solid system and a solid support to continue to provide value for the long term? And so that's going to be our challenge that we have to continue to be thoughtful, make smart decisions, strong collaboration. It's about sustainable growth in those three areas, economic, environmental, and social. And so, like I've said, with all of these pillars, I think we have the foundation. We have a pretty thorough sustainability plan that was written and implemented in 2016, as you know, and this is the roadmap, right? To achieve our vision of taking care of our environment, promoting economic vitality and social equality for all. And so it's um, gonna be very, very important um, around ensuring that we have a healthy economy, that we invest in our education and that uh, we have sustainable growth as we progress forward. And my question for you, Tim, as you're thinking about these three main pillars about economic vitality, education, and sustainability, okay? Yep. So let's go back in time to the 1980s when you were super. <laughs> Before we do that, well, let's, we'll save this for the next one because I do have another interview lined up. So I've got to get on my next Zoom session. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. but I'd love to answer. And wherever you were going with that question, I'd love to answer. Oh. Uh, but I've got somebody okay. waiting for me right now. Okay. Chris, thank you so much for your your time and your your contribution to this project, and in in longer term, your contribution to so much of what happens in Long Run. No, I appreciate you, Tim. Thanks for the interview. Take care of yourself and your family. Stay safe, and I look forward to when our paths cross and we can shake hands again. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Kimberly McKee, thank you so much for your willingness to contribute to this Longmont Voices and Vision Project and for all of your other contributions to the community. And uh, people are going to want to know what those are. So we want to start by learning about you. So tell us about Kimberly McKee, but also not just who you are, but what you do and the kinds of contributions you are making along the line. All right. Great. Thank you so much. This is such a great project, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. Um, I'm the executive director of the Downtown Development Authority in Longmont, and I moved to Longmont about nine years ago, and I've had the privilege and the honor to work with all of our great businesses that are located in downtown Longmont and really get to see it grow and thrive. Um, we've seen so many new folks come into this community, as well as the ones that have been here forever, and seeing those generations of business owners uh, work together has just been amazing. Um, I have two kids, uh, a sixth grader and a ninth grader, and I uh, live here in Old Town, so really everything I do is in downtown, um, and just love being here. Well, welcome to homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that I'm going to ask you three questions, and the first of those questions is this. In a time of uh, uncertainty, with all the unknowns which, which we're, with which we are living right now, and the fear that goes along with those. Um, people are having to find ways to get themselves through this period of uncertainty uh, in a kind of a, an experience none of us have ever had before. So right, there's no game plan here. How are you getting yourself through this period? You know, I think it's been a, a series of trial and error. And I will say when this first happened and it was such unknown and there was so much fear in the business community and the family, you know, I woke up some days and did not decide to be my best self, right? And I would get overwhelmed with the fear and wanting to help people and feeling so helpless. And about the third time that happened, I said, this is a choice and you need to wake up and you need to say, we are going to get through this together. And so, first of all, I had to really kind of switch my mindset to say, the only way we're going to get through this is to be calm and to be together and to really just do what we can do. Um, I love to cook and bake, and so I've been doing that in my spare time. As my coworker says, we'll probably all gain the COVID-19 because of all of the cooking <laughs> and takeout. I'm doing lots of takeout more than I normally would do, but um, you know, it's been a way to kind of work with my children. And you know, we have a wonderful neighbor up the street, um, older, you know, and so I take him up food all the time, which I would before, but not. I never cooked this much. And he said, you don't have to feed me, you know. I said, I, what am I going to do with all of this food? He said, all right, keep it coming. So um, I've been trying to just do that. And as I mentioned, you know, I have these two kids that are forced to be with me, right? So when they're that age, they kind of go to the other side of the sun and maybe don't like to hang out with their mom so much, but they're forced to be here. And so I'm embracing every moment of that and look at that as, as um, a luxury to have that time with them. Uh, so you, you have the the opportunity, the good fortune to be to be physically together with your kids. Uh, but it's in a time when, for the most part, we can't be together uh, with family and friends. So how, so other than your children, how are you staying connected to your family and friends during this time of physical separation and social distancing? Yeah, you know, like I said, we moved here nine years ago, and our family is all in Ohio. And um, I told a colleague of mine, Ohio has never felt so far away um, as it does today. And I will say I've not been wonderful at calling my mother in the way that I need to, but this has really got me to call her every day and to say, you know, oh my gosh. Um, and not that I didn't always value that relationship, but probably didn't take a pause out of my busy life enough to say, hey, I love you, I really miss you. And so uh, we've been doing that. We got my parents to do Zoom calls with my sister and, and, and my kids, even though we're all in the same house, we go in different rooms so we can Zoom call and have the whole experience, which has been great. Um, been reaching out to old friends from Ohio that um, you know I would talk to time to time, but I think that's really important. And you know, not to mention, um, your family, even here in Colorado, and I don't even mean family that I'm related to, but people and friends that I now consider family. And so making sure that I call or, or video chat with them because that connection is so important. And I think you really know when you're not seeing people on a daily basis, um, 
who it's really important to connect with and who if you don't connect with in this time and miss an opportunity, you will always regret it. So I do think it brings us back to that kind of sense of self. Well, uh, those are, that's a storyline that we're hearing in, in a lot of these interviews. Um, so the last question, which is also part of our collective story, is um, based on the presumption that uh, whatever was normal for us, whatever norm normal life was on the front end of this virus or pandemic, on the backside, whenever we come out of this and we'll come out of this, whatever the new normal is, life's going to be a little bit different. So the question is, what do you want to see in the new normal? And I'll add to that, what would you like to help create in the new normal when we can, we can go outdoors again and resume life? Yeah, you know, I will say again, I just really am, am, am struck by the value of people and how this is brought out sometimes the worst in people and sometimes the best in people, but mostly the best in people. And I have been humbled and sometimes brought to tears about the nature of our local business community. And when this first started, before even any of the stay at home orders, it was coming, right? And you could kind of see from a million miles away. And we had a business owner that got together a group of people and they said, we're gonna get through this. What are we gonna do? We're gonna work together. And it was very optimistic. That Monday, many of them had to close down, but they, still were going to be in it that Wednesday, some of them had to shutter their doors and just to see that kind of ripple effect and the change. Then there was a bit of a panic. So we got together groups and we have zoom calls with local businesses. One day it's retailers, one day it's restaurant and beverage, one day it's personal services. And to get these groups of people together and to hear there so these are folks that you may think could have been competitors right you know three weeks ago they might have been fighting for the same restaurant crowd when you really see them getting together as one and saying okay i have flour i'm not going to use you need flour i'm going to bring it over to you i'm going to do this i'm going to do that and then as they're navigating this no information is is confidential it is all for one and one for all and i will say it has been the most a rewarding experience. I mean, it's it's horrible, but I'm saying to see how people will pull together and know that they all need to rise and they all need to, to connect. And really being able to tell that tale or continue to tell that tale of these local businesses. And sometimes I feel that local businesses just get the pat on the head. You know, yeah, they're okay, but it's fun to go to every once in a while. I will tell you that is not true. These are savvy business owners. These are people that are the lifeblood of a community. They are what people want to talk about or want to say about why their community is unique. And they're all human. And to see these, this, this human element of, of, of working together. So out of this, I hope that doesn't change. And we will fight as an organization and a community to make sure that people don't go back into their silos in their everyday life. This is what is going to make or break, I think, the world. So I want to see that continuing. I want to continue to facilitate that. I hope the world says, boy, if I look at what's leaving our community, I hope they, they realize they don't want it to be those local businesses. And sometimes it is an extra trip. I mean, yeah, you can maybe go to a superstore and get everything on your list in one form or another but these local businesses i just lost your audio I just we just lost the connection there kimberly uh, hold on, oh, now you're back now you're back keep okay. going yeah this okay. is too good we're going to keep going because it's too good an interview did you, do you know where you lost me? Uh, well, that even if it's a second stop or a second trip people have to make. Okay. Because they could great. have gotten everything on their list at the big box store or wherever. Okay, great. Yeah, so even if it is a second um, stop, it's the uniqueness. It's, you know, I watch these local businesses really think about every product they bring into their store. Think about the connections. And I talk about the connections we have with each other. These folks have those same connections with their customers, and that's what you get. We have businesses that are calling their customers saying, how can I reopen that you'll feel safe? What am I going to do to make sure? They're really going above and beyond levels that we've ever seen before because they care, because that is what the fabric of this is about. 
So I do hope we come out of this with a brand new appreciation. And many people appreciated it. I'm not saying that, but a brand new appreciation for what local businesses give, not only from our citizens, but from our policymakers, from everyone. And I will say, and I don't want to get too political, but it, it's been um, a rough road to watch how things have gone and to see optimism that small businesses are going to get money to seeing who that went to at first. It's, it's a kick in the teeth, but we have fighters, right? And so now we're getting everyone racked to go in for that second round of funding. We just really want everyone to be here and people are cheering for each other. They're, they're helping each other fill out applications if, if someone's lost. So I really think that sense of local, that sense of teamwork is the foundation of our community and we can never lose that. Kimberly Key, those are, those are the kinds of aspirations and the kind of future that a lot of people will resonate with and too. Thank you again for your contribution, uh, the time that you spent with me in this interview, but uh, bigger and longer term are your contributions to the community. Take care of yourself, stay safe, take care of your family, and uh, one of these days, hopefully soon, we'll reemerge from our now safe at home and uh, order and uh, be able to be in the same room together. Thank you. Wow, thank you.